Summer, I love summer. You guys all like, everybody's ready for summer, right? We've been waiting for summer for months. Now it's finally here and all of our, you know, things kind of change. And, and we're already talking about, well, it's going to go fast, right? You're already thinking about, you know, here it is. It's June already. Summer's going to go fast. It's going to be fall before you know it. And, and uh, my purpose this year, like it is most summers, is I just want us to, to chill out, to take some time to get in rhythm of summer because it's a very important season for us. It's very important to restore us from what we've lost in the other seasons. And, you know, summer has these special things. I think back when I was uh, 16, 17 years old and living in the Midwest, and what I remember about summertime was rolling the windows down your car because you didn't have air conditioning to begin with, but rolling the windows down your car and driving in the evening, like 7, 8 o'clock, on country roads in the summertime. And just you can smell, you know, the, the crops and it's just like there's nothing like it. So if you, you know, see me driving down a road here in the summertime with my head out the window like a dog and my tongue flapping in the breeze, that's that's what's going on. I'm just kind of going back to, to summertime. But this just we do some things in the summer we don't do any of the time. I mean it's just a kind of a time to restore us. Uh, you'll see people walking in the neighborhood in the evening. And you don't see them sometimes, don't see couples doing that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's about, you know, taller glasses of sweet tea and lemonade. And uh, some of you are going to be sitting by the pool all summer. And, um, you know, homemade ice cream and strawberries. Kind of here for strawberries and homemade ice cream. I mean, this is summertime. you got to do this stuff because we don't do it any other time of the year. And it's the beach and gardening, all that junk. And, you know, I just love it. And it it's really serves a purpose for us. Um, there's a purpose. There's a it's time to restore what's been lost, you know, uh, in the winter. Uh, we lived in, lived in Florida for two years in Orlando for two years, and like us, the whole time that I was there, I was completely out of rhythm. It never did make sense because you never really had you had summer, but you didn't have winter. You know, winter was just kind of this gray time where it didn't rain. You know. And the rest of the year, it rained every afternoon at 4 o'clock, but in the wintertime, it didn't rain. But it just, you know, it never did like it. But what I want us to do this time, it kind of helps us sync back with God. And, and you understand that the whole sync concept of technology where, you know, some of you are, are iPhones and some of us are, are in the superior system of Google and, and we keep everything synced all the time. You know, if I put something on my calendar on my phone, it's automatically synced to my calendar and all my computers and all that stuff. And, you know, it updates everything. It's just fantastic to, to have everything just stay in sync and in rhythm with each other. But rhythm is a really important thing, and we're going to talk about that next year. Rhythm is, is in nature. You know, there's a, there's a rhythm to the season. There, there's a rhythm, rhythm to movement of the planets, and all of creation has a, an order and a rhythm to it and patterns. And sometimes, you know, if you get things out of sync or out of rhythm, it can really be quite destructive. Have you ever walked on a, one of those swinging bridges and had a couple of jerks behind you that started walking in sync and, and, and the bridge starts, yeah, some of you have, the bridge starts going like that. And you know, actually, um, people in the military, uh, when troops would cross big bridges, they, they tell troops to, you know, to break step. They don't march in sync because them all coming down at the same time will send a wave through the bridge and could destroy even a large bridge. So, you know, it has, it has a lot of power there. But we get out of sync, you know, it's just like uh, last week was uh, Memorial Day, and how many of you didn't know what day of the week it was all week? You know, you had the day off, go through the whole week and go, it seems like Wednesday, but it's Thursday or it's Tuesday, you know, I don't know. But it, uh, holidays always kind of throw us off where you just kind of get out of sync. And, Maybe, you know, if you can't sleep at night, you're out of sync all day. And, and there's, my point is, there's a rhythm to life. There, there's a, a God-created rhythm to life. And when you get out of rhythm, it, it can really be kind of destructive. On the last, last night that Jesus was with his disciples, he is trying to teach them so many things. He's trying to tell them about the Holy Spirit that was going to come to them, how the Holy Spirit was going to live in them. 
He taught them about loving each other. Remember, we, he taught them how to wash each, each other's feet and how to serve each other. And he also gave them another analogy concerning grapevines. And on the side of the temple there in Jerusalem where they were on that last night, there was this golden frieze of a grapevine up on the side of the temple. And that grapevine was symbolic to them of how God was providing for them, how they were in the promised land, and God would always provide for them, and that's what that grapevine meant. And while they were there, Jesus says, I'm the true vine. And so our, our passage today is from John 15, 1 through 8. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. That's, this is a very important statement by Jesus. Uh, first, this is a statement of his identity. He says, I'm the true vine. And this is one of the seven I am statements that's in John. Uh, you're probably familiar with this. They all tell us something about who Jesus is. He says, I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And then this last one here is he says, I'm the true vine. And each one of these reveals something about the identity of him. But there's, there's one more that's not included usually in this package of seven. But it's an I am statement by Jesus. And, and he was uh, talking to some of the Jewish leaders. And they were really very skeptical because he was claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be God. And they didn't believe him. And he says to them in John 8, 58, and just wanted to give you this, you know, since we're on the I am's. John 8, 58, he says, he says um, to them, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So he's really telling them about his, uh, his divinity that that he's greater than Abraham, that way back in time, that he was there as the Christ. And in this I am statement in John 15, he says, I'm the true vine. Now, that illustration really worked for them because they knew all about vine dressing. They were involved in that all the time, and they would have had some experience with some great vines, and they are around them all the time. And Jesus uses some real um, you know, agrarian common knowledge uh, to kind of explain to them how to stay in sync with God, how to maintain this rhythm of life so they'll bear fruit. And it's really very simple. He says, I am the vine. I'm the source of life. And from me comes the, the sap. It comes the nutrients. And we've all seen uh, great vines around here now. We're starting to have some, some vineyards pop up as they're trying you know, to find something to replace uh, tobacco, and you've seen the gnarly, you know, vines of the grapevines and all the knobby vines. And he says, you're the branches, branches. You're connected to me. You come off of me. You're attached to me. You grow off of me. You are the ones that produce the fruit. See, the vine doesn't produce the fruit. It's the branches that are needed to produce the fruit. And that is why you are attached to me, so you can produce some fruit. Now, then it gets just a little bit more difficult because he says, my father is the vine dresser and the, the branch does not produce the fruit. If it does not produce the fruit, the vine dresser cuts off the branch. Now, I don't want us to take this illustration beyond the point that Jesus is making that he is in fact the true vine. Now, I don't really want us to get you know kind of sidetracked today to try to figure out who are the branches that are going to be cut off or have been cut off or how do you get cut off? But um, it doesn't sound good. I mean, 
<laughs> there's fire involved and there's burning and being thrown away. So, you know, there's, we have a little cautionary statement there, but I, let, let's not go down there and try to figure out who all those people are. But, the, but it's enough that the father is the vine dresser. He's the one that's doing the trimming and everybody gets cut, not just those that are being thrown away. He says that if you produce fruit, that I'm going to trim you. I'm going to prune you so you can bear more fruit, you know. And so we'll talk about that in some subsequent weeks. But uh, what does it mean to abide? That's not, that's not a word, you know, if someone says, hey, uh, what time are you going to the game? You say, oh, I think I'm going to abide here at home for a while. You know, they'd wonder, you know, exactly what country you were from. Or, uh, it's not a word that we use a lot, but it, the central point in teaching what Jesus is giving to his disciples was to abide. And, and, and the word, the root word here uh, is meno in, in the Greek. And again, you know, just bear with me. But it means stay. It means don't leave. Stay put. So they would use this word to say, stay in the field, stay in the boat, stay in the house, you know, abide. And some more modern translations say remain. Uh, the message, which isn't really a translation, says, live in me, make your home in me. And uh, today's NIV in John 15, 4 says it this way, it says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So stay home in me. Don't, don't leave. I want you to stay home. I don't want you going anyplace else. Stay home in me in the same way that I stay home in you. That's what he says. You remain in me the way that I remain in you. So Jesus reveals this covenant relationship here about how we are in him and he is in us and how we have died to our old selves and we are alive in him and he has made us a lot, made us his home in us, and we are to make our home in him. It's a reciprocal relationship, just like a branch on the vine. And he says, there will be a lot of fruit if you live in me. It's just a natural thing to happen. You abide in me, there's going to, I'm, it's going to be fruit that come out of you because you're attached to the vine. You must stay in me. But if you do not live in me, you're not going to be able to bear any fruit. You won't be able to do anything. As a matter of fact, you'll be just kind of like a great branch that's cut off, just thrown down there on the ground. Now, I think it's difficult to remain or to abide. Our, our very nature, our human nature says, I, I don't need that. Our human nature says, I'm strong enough on my own, I'm smart enough, I'm skilled enough, I'm connected enough with other people. Um, as a matter of fact, our human nature says that I don't really need to get everything from God. God is more like a consultant to me. He's more like my assistant, you see. And so I will use him to help me. But this whole idea of being connected in him, just, you know, it goes against our human nature. And there's a lot of competition, I think, alternatives to abiding in him. I mean, there's the pace of life, which I'm kind of preaching at us this summer to just slow down. Just, just rest a little bit this summer. Let your pace come down a little bit. Take some time. But the, but the whole pace of life that we are in says, I don't really have time to do that, you know. And then the, the whole multitasking thing, where we all pride ourselves on our ability to multitask now. You can't multitask and abide. Remaining in him is a one-track thing. You do that alone. And the whole secular worldview now that we are immersed in is where human beings think that, that if there's a problem in the world that we can fix it. No matter what it is, we can fix it. The latest thing now is that, if, oh, there's, there was a hurricane. Well, who caused that? Oh, there's a tornado. we we got to stop these tornadoes. Now, now we think that we're going to actually manipulate the weather in the world, you know. But again, it's this, this, this secular worldview that we think that human beings are in control of everything and that we can do it all. And there's a lot of other vines. I mean, there are other vines for us to attach to. It's not easy in our culture. And perhaps the, the greatest threat to the ultimate success in life of staying in Christ, of abiding in Him and living in Him, the greatest threat 
hear me, the greatest threat is our own success apart from him. The more successful that we are on our own, the greater that threat is for us. Because we think, I'm doing all right. I can do this by myself. God has helped me a little bit. Yea, God. He's a nice consultant, nice assistant. I grabbed this post from a young lady named Marion. She said, nearly seven years ago, I started a business. I prayed diligently about the decision, and I sensed God's confirmation to move forward. Because of my inexperience in retail operations, I depended heavily on God for wisdom and direction. Between the first time I caught a vision for this venture and the day we opened our doors, I prayed every step of the way. On opening day, customers lined up around the building. With pounding heart and sweaty palms, I became acutely aware of the fact that the success or failure of this business rested on me. For the next four years, I ran the store as if that were true. Instead of praying for God's wisdom or listening to the counsel of trusted advisors, like my husband Dan, who was always my business partner, I relied on my own understanding. I simply was too busy and preoccupied to spend my time reading my Bible. And when I did make time, I found myself rereading the same passage over and over and never grasping the words. Daily preoccupation over my work took the place of our daily quiet time with God. The longer I skimped in my spiritual life, the further I fell from the vine. And the further I fell from the vine, the more all my efforts proved fruitless. Making decisions apart from God and Dan started to have a snowball effect and eventually led to the demise of our business and nearly our marriage. Looking back on those four years, I know now what was at play. Apart from Christ, I could do nothing. Instead of remaining in Jesus as he instructs us to do, I ran on ahead without him. Happens all the time probably happened in your life, maybe not to that magnitude, maybe on a smaller scale. We learn to remain or abide, I think, in other places of comfort, you know. If I'm not abiding in Jesus, then then where is it that I'm abiding? Where am I, I finding my power for everyday life? I ask myself that question personally. Where do I go for comfort? I notice that I go many places for comfort, but I notice that, that one place of comfort is my ability to accurately identify who has done something wrong and then to voice my cynicism, okay, and to accurately state what they should have done. I'm really good at that. So when some of you are laughing, (laughs) I don't know whether it's funny or not. So I get on my soapbox and I usually preach to the air or Nina, who's ever closest, and she has to listen to it, right? <laughs> but, but I'm really good at articulating how immature this person is, or this group of people, or this, you know, government, or whatever. And w- when I get really depleted and I lack power, or I've had a bad week, that's where I go. And it helps. It really does. It helps. I feel very empowered, very noticed, like people are listening to me for a while, you know? If I get on Facebook and do a rant on there and maybe get four likes, I really feel like somebody has heard me. You know what I mean? So I just abide right there in that critical, cynical vine. And what I produce is a bunch of rotten fruit, right, that nobody wants to eat. Or I'll flop down in the chair and and start watching something on TV that normally I would not watch. Um... If you walked in the room, I'd probably change the channel. Right? You go, really, Don? Come on, let's get real here. Let's let's get real about this. It's not easy to remain in Jesus all the time. This is not an easy thing to do. Because there are other vines that will help us for a little bit. My comforter, my abiding place can be cynicism. It can be rebellion. And, and I'd always thought that those things were just bad habits. But then I began to see that they actually serve a purpose in my life. They make me feel empowered for a while. I feel pretty good for a while. They, along with other things, are just untrue vines. We, we can identify our spiritual vines, our untrue vines, rather simply 
When you are depleted, when you feel unheard, when, when you are, let's say, rejected or anxious or tired, wherever you want to go there, what do you do? Some people, like we talk about here oftentimes, self-medicate. They go take some self-medication. They sell it at every store here. You know, you get some self-medicate or you can get it from a friend. Some people run away. Some people get angry. Some people turn inward into some old patterns of self-talk and fear and anxiety. And we all have a different vine that we can go to. And, you know, let's be real. It works a little bit. It relieves things or we wouldn't go there. It works a little bit. And Jesus says, stay home. Stay home in me. Live in me like I live in you. Did you catch that part? He says, abide in me the same way that I live in you. In other words, I'm never leaving you. So you stay home in me. Abide. It's a matter of faithfulness. It's a matter of obedience, I know. But it's also a matter of practical daily life. Jesus says, remain in him, not as a test, but as a way to find this abundant life that he wants to give us. Substitutes just don't work. Remain 24-7. The difficulty seems to arise for many of us in the reality that main, remaining in Christ is 24-7. It, that's what it means to abide. We, we live in Christ. And, you know, we all compartmentalize life to a great we have um, work, entertainment, God, maybe some other things in there. So we work 60 hours, you know, and we have some expertise there. And we have a vine that we attach to there, our reputation, our skills, our, you know, our abilities there, you know, pecking order. And, uh, you know, we can, we can attach to that and we can be very proficient in that. Or, you know, we, we have a vine that we can attach to in, in our entertainment or our sports. And, and, and then for God, well, we attach to Christ. And, and we'll pray for a while and we'll study for a while. We'll rest for a while. We'll abide in him. And he's there. It's not like he ever goes, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. I said 24-7, just doing like 1-1. One, one. <laughs> okay? He says, abide in me the way that I abide in you. He's always there. And we, we go back to him. He's always there. But let me ask you, let me ask you this. What if your technology just worked 1-1? One, one? What or 2-1? What if it just worked for two hours on Sunday? Maybe 15 minutes. What if your smartphone only functioned for 15 minutes on Sunday morning? You're going you're gonna to pay the bill? No. You're going to get rid of your smartphone. It's stupid. What if you only got a text? Just, a, just a radically. Just like, you know, 15 minutes a day all the texts came through at once. Right? We go, this is stupid. I'm not going to do this. No, we expect things to sync continually. And the availability that we have with a smartphone uh, is what makes them sell and why people love them. Either we are connected or we're not connected. Either we're abiding or we're not abiding. There's no in-between area. There's no gray area here. You see, it's, it's off or on. And Jesus says, it only works if you remain in me 24-7. In the mid-1600s, there was a layman who was, a, uh, who was named uh, Lawrence. He was called Brother Lawrence. He uh, was in a Carmelite monastery in Paris, France, and Brother Lawrence became known for his life of what he called practicing the presence of God. And, you know, we think of monks, and they're very holy, and they know scripture, and they're, you know, very sacrificial people. But Brother Lawrence, what he became known for was the joy with which he, he washed dishes, the joy with which he could sweep the floor. Because he didn't compartmentalize his life. He says, it's all God's, you see? And for me to remain in God, then that means every minute of my day is holy time, potentially. And so he, he has this one quote, which really doesn't, this quote that we're going to put up, it, it really doesn't encapsulate everything that he was. But he's a wonderful little guy. He says, We ought not to be weary of doing little things for the love of God, who regards not the greatness of the work, but the love with which it is performed. So he looked at every minute of his day as being a holy time. 
some very menial things he was doing that we would look at and say, well, that's not religious at all. He'd say, yes, it is, because I'm doing it for the joy of, of God. I'm abiding in him. All of his life was holy. No such thing as a moment beyond God. And that doesn't mean that he is this weird guy that just went around going, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all the time. We probably would not have noticed that he was any different than anybody else, except he had a joy in everything that he did. And so in, instead of dividing his, his time into God's stuff and my stuff, it all became God and my stuff. See, it was all together. It was integrated. Now, how do we do this? Well, we're going to talk about that for the next eight weeks. We're going to answer that all summer. There's no easy fix here, but we're going to look at seven necessary characteristics of life, and each one is a part of our abiding and our growth. And I just want to give us today, you know, since this whole concept of abiding in Christ is one that we may never have thought about too much, I want to give us a test to see if we're abiding. Look at verse 7. It says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done by you. Now, we can turn this around. Well, we can turn this sentence around to get discernment as to whether we are abiding or living in Christ or not. He says that if we are abiding, then our prayers will all be answered. Are all your prayers answered? Are all your prayers answered all the time? You go, well, have you prayed for something and God said, no? Well, I think we could safely say that at the time that we asked that prayer that we were not abiding in him because if we were abiding in him, his word says that if we abide in him and we ask that it will be done. So at that time that we asked that prayer, we were not abiding. We, we were not connected. Years ago, I was um, interviewing for a church that I thought that I very much wanted to serve. Um, it was in a great town, and the church uh, seemed like a, just a perfect fit. Um, everybody I talked to that knew the church and knew me said, oh, this is a natural for you. This would be great, perfect fit for them. So um, started talking, and they asked for some videos, and I sent them uh, some preaching videos, and I, and I sent them uh, sermon videos, and they said, oh, you're fantastic. Obviously, they got good taste, you know, so they you know, they, they liked my preaching. That was that was okay, and they wanted to see, uh, you know, some examples of some things that I had done, so I sent them some examples, and man, we were, things were going on really well, and, you know, I was drafting a three-month plan and a one-year plan in my head as about how I was going to be, you know, just really turn this church around and just going to really save this church, and, you know. For those of you who don't know me, there's a bunch of sarcasm there, but really that was and that was the thought in my head. Let's be honest about it. So, you know, start packing. We need to get things going here. And I could just see the first buds of fruit starting to bloom down there. And, you know, I was praying that God would call me to that church. And then I got an email, and the email said it was just really short and sweet and really kind of rude. Um, well and said, uh, we are sorry, but we have differences of uh, belief with you and we feel that there will be problems, so we are withdrawing you from consideration. I was crushed. I couldn't believe somebody had rejected me. Obviously, obviously they were theologically wrong, and they were. I mean, that's, that's the whole point. They were, and, 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 and God, God really did, you know, save me from going to that church and for God said no but now I look back on that whole thing and you know I realize that I was not abiding in Christ because had I been abiding in Christ um, it would not have been a no I never would have prayed the prayer you see and it can be uh, a test for us as our prayers are no that we realize that at this time in my life that I'm not connected. I've got some other vine that I'm connecting to. Well, that's about enough for today. Uh, just, just one last thing. We, we hear this, and if, if you're like me, you go, oh, no, man, uh, that made me squirm a little bit because I get a lot of no answers to my prayers. So that means I'm not abiding. 
oh, you know, I'm going to get cut off and thrown into the fire and there's pressure and all that stuff. And please don't hear that today. Please don't hear that. that that's, that's not what's being said. The fruit that's produced is produced because of Jesus, not because of your hard work or your skill or your holiness. The fruit that is produced, he says, comes from me. So this is a guilt-free zone. This is a place where we rest in him. And we say, Lord, it's your work. It's your work in me. It's not my work. But I'm just going to abide in you. I'm just going to rest in you this summer. I'm going to spend some time with you. And if that means that you're spending time with him washing the floor, or gardening, or prayer, or Bible study, or taking a walk with the neighbor, you see, it's all the same. It's all the same time. There's no holier time than other holy time when you're abiding with him. Is that enough? All right, let's have a prayer. As deep cries out